Hello everyone, I of course am Christine Gritman and welcome to the very first episode of how I do my job. So this, this is going to be coming at you the first Wednesday of every single month right here on Agora Pulse to talk to professionals who are actually in the social media field doing social media day in and day out about the topic of the month. And this month's topic is back to school. So of course I had to bring on the first guest that I thought of was my friend Alexa Heinrich. Many of you know her through her accessible social initiative where she talks about digital accessibility in social media. But you may not know that she is also the social media manager for St. Petersburg College in Florida. And in addition to all of that, and educating other people on digital accessibility practices in her spare time. She also, like the rest of us, has to be constantly educating herself and upping her game just as a social media professional in general. Um, please do tell us where you're watching, by the way. We are live right now on Agora Pulse's LinkedIn page, on Agora Pulse's YouTube channel, and I have also embedded this in the Social Media Pulse community. So let us know where you're watching and definitely weigh in. We want to hear your questions and your comments. All right, without any further ado, let me bring Alexa on. Hello, Alexa. How are you today? I am great. Thank you for having me today. Also, I just have to commend you for like the wonderful intro. I can never do things the first time <laughs> through like that. So that was really impressive. As you know, I spend a lot of time on camera. <laughs> and I know that you, like many of us in social, wear a lot of different hats. So even though I gave a bit of an introduction there, um, I, it would be great if you could tell us kind of in your own words, all the things you do and sort of what that mix looks like because you have a lot of different irons in the fire. Sure. So first and foremost, I am the social media manager for St. Petersburg College in Central Florida. So I'm right outside the Tampa Bay area. I handle all of the organic social for the college and our different campuses. So we have several campuses throughout Pinellas County. We're the oldest state college in the state of Florida. Um, when I'm not working at St. Pete, I am educating others about digital accessibility for social media content through presentations and the accessible social website, which I launched earlier this year. So you can find different information about how your visuals impact social media and accessibility video, so on and so forth. And then when I'm not doing that, I also run social media tea which is a online outlet for digital professionals who primarily are working in social media or other digital marketing avenues where they can share their confessions about what it's actually like to work in social media. And we all certainly need that space to commiserate and to know that what we're going through is normal, right? <laughs> yes, yes. All right, so let's start there uh, with your full-time job as a social media manager for St. Petersburg College. So I'd love to hear a little bit about um, what that entails, sort of what you do day in, day out uh, in that job. Sure, so most of it is content creation with the rest of my team. So I'm part of a marketing and strategic comms department and we have different sections of that. So creative, video, web, content. I'm part of the content team. So we work to share the stories of St. Pete, um, the stories of our students, our alumni, our faculty and staff. I do a lot of copywriting, copy editing, a lot of scheduling um, for content across our various channels. And I do a lot of event coverage as well. So going to different campuses, different locations throughout the county and doing photography co coverage, uh, video, B-roll footage, um, interviewing students a lot. So there's kind of a mixed bag of all the content, but I am primarily on a content creation uh, schedule for the most point, for the most part is it's just content creation. Now, who is your audience for the most part? Is it is it current students, prospective students, parents, the internal community? Who are you talking to on social? So it's mostly students, current and prospective, but we also have their parents that we talk to for the younger students. There's also our community stakeholders, so people within the businesses and different industries that help our students get jobs. 
And of course, we also have different educational institutions that we partner with because we are a state college. And in Florida, that means we primarily offer two-year degrees. We do have four-year degrees, but we're mostly a two-year degree uh, institution. And then also different leaders and politicians within the state of Florida, because we are a public institution. So we do a lot of work with different, different people to bring scholarships, grants, new programs to our students. Now, do you, oops, sorry. <laughs> now, when you're speaking to those different audiences, are there, are there different content types that are really aimed at each? Are there different platforms? Sort of how, how do you differentiate to make sure that the people that you're really speaking to are getting that particular message? There's definitely a different tone that's used for our different platforms. Um, like LinkedIn is very different from how we use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It's very PR driven. So when we're in the media, when we're in the news, when we post different stories, if we have faculty or staff that are winning awards, that's really where it goes is to LinkedIn, just because it's a very buttoned up platform and that kind of content performs very well there. So that's really for alumni, faculty, staff, and industry leaders to kind of check out. And then Instagram is the exact opposite. It's the fun platform. It's the platform where I don't want to talk about registration. I don't want to talk about scholarships. I want to show what our students are up to when they're not in the classroom, how they're having fun while they're getting a great education at an affordable price. So it definitely varies. And I really enjoy kind of working with those different tones and knowing that I have to do different things for different platforms. What sort of content tends to get the best results for you, whether that means engagement, whether that means awareness, whether that means uh, people actually clicking through? And uh, does it differ based on goal or are there certain post types that really tend to just outperform? I would say that any post that is showing our students either having fun or succeeding goes over so well. So graduation is always like, I know that my stats are going to be super inflated for the month because everyone loves graduation. They love seeing our students crossing the platform. They love seeing them throwing their caps. They love reading their caps, getting their degree, all that stuff. If a student is smiling, usually that's the content that goes over really well. People just like knowing that our students are thriving. So that's the content that performs the best on any of our platforms, really. That makes sense. Have there been any particular uh, content campaigns where you really needed to achieve something specific that you can think of? Yes, definitely. So Giving Tuesday, which happens the Tuesday after Thanksgiving in the United States, is huge for educational institutions here in the States. So the last few years, we've done big campaigns to get people to donate to our foundation fund, which you know supports our students and their different endeavors. We have emergency funds that people can donate to, program funds. So I usually do a really big organic push for Giving Tuesday to achieve our monetary goals, which the last three years we have exceeded every single year, which is awesome. We've raised thousands of dollars to support our students. What kind of stuff performs well for those fundraising efforts? Are there any particular types of things that really get people to open up their wallets and give? Um, so our student testimonials definitely do really well. People like to hear from students who have benefited from scholarships, um, from the foundation, but also the day of me just kind of going wild on any of our accounts, like freaking out that we hit a milestone or, oh my gosh, we're almost there. And just kind of being my like typical funny self is, uh, really engaging apparently. So if I'm just using like a bunch of freak out gifs everyone thinks it's kind of funny and then you can kind of see them engaging with the social more. So. So that actually brings me to a question I hadn't even thought of. To what degree are you sort of a face of the college and do you have other people who sort of function that way on the college's social as well? Um, I'm not really f visible from the SPC social media. 
Uh, people know that I run it, but for the most part, I try to make sure that the college is the star of the show and not myself. Obviously, when I do things in my personal life, I am introduced as the social media manager for St. Petersburg College. But when I'm working, I'm really just behind the scenes. We did have a funny occurrence last year when we did a streamed uh, commencement ceremony for graduation. And I was monitoring the live stream and the comments and a bunch of our deans and faculty were in the comments. And the one of the deans who I adore outed me as she just kept calling the account Alex. <laughs> I was like, Dean Demers, you can't tell people that it's me. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. <laughs> so it was really funny. Everyone got a kick out of it. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you've got your fans. Uh, who tends to engage the most? Does it tend to be the current students? And do you have engagement and sharing and all of that from faculty? Or does it tend to be kind of student based? It depends on the platform. So when it comes to like Twitter, we see a lot of faculty and community members sharing that content, whereas Instagram is definitely more of potential students and current students really like to engage with that content. Facebook is really a mixed bag. We have faculty, staff, students, parents that engage. And then LinkedIn is definitely mostly alumni, faculty, staff, and industry leaders that we see. Um, our content actually does really, really well on LinkedIn and we get a lot of engagement there. Um, I think it's mostly just because everyone feels pretty comfortable using LinkedIn from a professional standpoint. So yeah. they're they're readily engaging with the content there. Have you seen a show? How, well, how long have you been doing social media for St. Petersburg College? I just passed my three year anniversary in June. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> in those three years, have you noticed a shift either on um, engagement on platforms or even what type of content tends to hit? Have you seen any shifts that you'd be able to pinpoint and what's working? I would say we definitely get more engagement now on Twitter than we previously did just because Twitter is my favorite child. So I've tried to give it more love because it was underperforming when I first joined the team. So we get more people engaging there. And I've been really adamant about, you know, faculty and staff, you can totally engage with the accounts, like not just engaging with the accounts, but you can share your own content from your classrooms or your campus and the college will engage with you. We have a few new people who have joined uh, leadership and I was pleasantly surprised that they jumped right in and have been sharing content from their personal Twitter accounts. So that's been really great to see because it gives me something to engage with and I don't always have to be the one creating the content. Sometimes it's just me engaging with content. Absolutely. Um, so you, of course, I imagine look at other uh, people in your industry. So other higher ed social accounts. So what do you see? Are there any particular trends in higher ed social that maybe the rest of us might not notice that you're seeing a lot of? I don't know if there's any trends that we wouldn't be aware of, but I would say that within higher education, obviously TikTok has become like the go-to for recruiting students. We have yet to launch a TikTok with the college just because I don't have the bandwidth right now, but it's in the plan to do that. But yeah, a lot of colleges and universities heavily rely on TikTok for recruitment just because it's where younger students are, which is also why I'm not too worried because SBC has a diverse population of students. We have a lot of students who are non-traditional, so they're older or they're coming back for their education. Um, they're trying to upskill for work. So it's really a mixed bag of demographics and ages when it comes to our students. So not quite as worried about TikTok, but I am looking forward to when we do launch it just because it's another avenue to reach out to students. Could also be fun from a user generated content standpoint too. Um, do you use any user generated content from, from students, professors, anything like that? And if so, uh, what sort of makes it to the main? Um, I really like on Instagram kind of using our students content, especially around graduation. Graduation is huge because I'm typically monitoring our stream or whatever I, what I'm supposed to be doing from the, the booth. So where we are stationed for 
graduation. So I'm not running around and doing event coverage. So I rely heavily on the content from students, faculty, and staff who are participating in the ceremony. And we get some really fun content um, from our faculty and staff when they're on the floor. Just this past May, I took a break during commencement, went and trolled through all of our provost Facebook pages because I'm friends with all of them. They had taken a great group shot in the tunnel before they came out. I'm like, yeah, that's what I want. This is what I want. Stole it. Didn't even tell them. I'm like, this is going on the main page. Those moments so, that just happen and are really genuine instead of looking yeah. like, you know, stock images in a brochure. Exactly. Yeah. We love, like I said, graduation content always goes over so well. And I mean, it's my favorite kind of content because it's the whole purpose of what we do working in higher education is that moment right there. So, but yeah, that user generated content from graduation is always wonderful to see and, you know, always makes me feel really happy with what we do for the college. Well, that actually brings me to another question, which are what are kind of the beats in your year content wise? Graduation, of course, is a big one. I would imagine right now, sort of back to school time mm -hmm. might be a big one for you as well. So what does that sort of calendar look like for you in higher education? It's really a lot of registration and graduation breaks up most of the year. Everything else are the smaller events that we do throughout the year. We have some giving days, obviously, that I need to focus on. This year is the first year that we're doing what we're calling SBC Day, where we celebrate the birth of the college, so to speak, because our 100th anniversary will be coming up in five years. So that's exciting for us. But it's definitely mostly centered around graduation. And it's not just, oh, fall graduation. It's like, here's the 16 week, here's the eight week, here's the second eight week. So there's a lot that goes on within registration. And then of course, welcoming students, faculty and staff back to the campuses because we have breaks in between uh, our semesters. So there's always something on the calendar. What's the focus right now? I imagine now you're welcoming students back, right? So how, so how are you playing this current season? So we have 11 campuses. We have several that are our larger campuses. And really, it's a lot of welcome back events that the student life and leadership coordinators will plan. So I rely heavily on them when it comes to content from their events, because I obviously can't be at every single one or every campus every day. So when they have events, they'll funnel content to me or they'll post it on to the campus Facebook page and let me know like, hey, I posted this, feel free to use it. Here's the context that you need. So it's a lot of welcome back, a lot of webinars kind of helping students understand where their classes are, how to use advising, the different student support services that we have, and just making sure that they're set up for success before the semester really kicks off in two weeks. Do you tend to... Oops. To that end about your own sort of content beats, do you notice different engagement patterns at those? So obviously, as you said, everyone across the board, all your audiences, all the content, they're all about graduation. So we know what it is at that time of year. But other times of year, are there certain times of year where you see more, more prospects engaging or more parents versus more students versus more staff members? Or does it tend to be kind of the same mix? It's kind of the same mix, but we definitely within like the the month leading up to the start of a big semester. So what I consider big semesters are fall and spring. Summer is usually quieter. We definitely get a lot of questions from students who are trying to make sure that they have everything good to go from parents who want to make sure that their students have everything lined up or are there orientation events that they need to come to. So it's really that month leading up to a big semester starting that we see a lot more engagement, a lot more messages in the inbox when I log in in the morning, for sure. Just lots of students who are clearly trying to make sure they've got everything ready to go before they start the semester. Now, are there other accounts? Are there sub accounts for like athletics or, or anything like that? And if so, what is your involvement with those? So we do have several sub accounts. We have, obviously we have all the main ones for the college, but then we have uh, Facebook pages for all the campuses. We have Twitter accounts for all of our athletic teams. And then there's you know some 
one-off accounts like the theater department and workforce development, stuff like that. So I do have a hand in all the accounts at the college, just because I am the only full-time social media professional at the college. Um, I try mostly to guide people when it comes to best practices, the kind of content they should be putting out. I will obviously attend bigger events or sometimes when athletics wants to make sure that each of their teams gets coverage throughout the year, I will attend different games, which I really like doing because I get to do um, sports photography, which is really fun for me. So it's really a matter of I'm here as a resource for you if you need help with content creation, scheduling, anything like that. So I get people calling me all the time of like, does this make sense if I post this to this platform? I'm like, yeah. So I'll help kind of guide people even with their personal accounts. So I had one of my coworkers call me the other day of, hey, I saw this posted from our baseball coach. I want to repurpose it to kind of put a spin on career services. Can we do that? I was like, yeah, I don't see why not. So I kind of coached him through what he should write from his personal Twitter to repurpose that content that he liked. And it turned out really nice. So nice. Uh, before working for St. Petersburg College, uh, were you already in social media and also um, did, had you already worked in higher ed? Sort of what was the background before you started this position? So before I was with St. Pete, I worked for City Colleges of Chicago for six years. So that's the largest community college system in the state of Illinois and one of the largest in the country. I worked for their district office in various positions right after I graduated from college, essentially. So I was with them for about six years. I started in their marketing department as a designer. I went to uh, academic affairs after a year and was a project coordinator for their catalog and scheduling. And then I came back to marketing as a marketing representative and then eventually a content specialist. My boss at the time kind of asked me when I came back to marketing, what do you want to do with this position? And I said, please give me social media. <laughs> so that's how I started my professional social media life was just kind of asking for it. Yeah. And, and being really willing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to help the accounts be more engaging and less like a bulletin board for yeah. events and registration information. Uh, so that's basically what I did, and I really enjoyed it. And then my parents retired to Florida, and I was like, okay, I love Chicago, but mom and dad are really far away. I don't like it. Yeah. So I found a position down here with St. Petersburg College, and I've been in higher education, again, for almost 10 years now. Wow. So higher education, of course, is a fairly specific industry. Um, what are some things that you've learned in your time doing social media and marketing in higher ed that are or maybe are not? Well, let's start with are relevant to other industries, do you think? Well, it's like any other in industry. You don't want to treat your followers as numbers. You want to engage with them and create a community. We definitely have student followers who actively engage with our accounts and love engaging with our accounts. And because of that, I love engaging with them. So we know that they're great supporters of the college. They post great content. They leave great comments. Sometimes they're helpful if they see a question asked on the piece of content and I don't get to it. Sometimes I'll find that a student has answered it for me. I'm like, okay, cool. So really, you you know, helping your community grow and stay engaged is universal with whatever industry you work in for social media. Absolutely. Is there ever any educational content or is it pretty much all, you know, branding and community building? It's a lot of branding awareness and community building, but we do uh, do a lot of event coverage. That's like a staple of higher education. It's journalism. We, yeah, it, it is. Um, a lot of different uh, news about our programs and how they help grow students for their professional lives. So that's a big thing when you work for a state college is we know that our students aren't necessarily going to transfer to a four-year university. They might just go straight to working. So there's not 100% focus on, okay, you're going to transfer and get a bachelor's degree. A lot of them is just trying to help them upskill or gain skills for their professional careers. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. 
Uh, to that end, speaking of gaining skills, uh, that's kind of a good time to transfer to another thing that takes up a lot of your time and energy and skill, which is that you have become um, very well known in the digital accessibility space and specifically on educating others on digital accessibility. Could you kind of walk us through how you initially got into that field? Sure. So like a lot of people, when it comes to accessibility for different areas of digital marketing, I learned about it by accident. Um, I was working in Chicago for city colleges and part of my job as a content specialist was it was primarily social media, but I was also responsible for other things like external advertising and some of the digital assets on our website. And I was adding uh, sliders. So, you know, when you go to a website and they slide through on the homepage, I was adding those to our homepage one day and the digital strategist on my team, who is my good friend, asked me if I was adding alt text to the sliders. And I distinctly remember looking at like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, so I don't have web development uh, knowledge or didn't at least at the time. So she kind of explained what alt text was and how it impacts a website and people who have serious vision disabilities, people who use screen readers. And I just remember going home and doing more research on it personally because I was so curious about this space and how it potentially impacted my social media content for the college. And I distinctly remember crying at home because I felt so bad that I wasn't oh, no. doing this. Yeah. <laughs> I felt super guilty because in my head, I was a barrier to someone getting oh. a college education, which is probably really that's a little exaggerated. <laughs> yeah. That's probably super exaggerated. But yeah. But still, I wanted to do better, so I started to do my own research into what accessibility meant for social media content, and I just never stopped learning about it, and then I started sharing that information with my peers within higher education, and then outside of higher education with everyone. The pandemic happened, and suddenly I had more time that I wasn't spending commuting mm -hmm. to kind of grow this area uh, with the information I was sharing and how I was sharing it. So it was, it was definitely by accident and it's been just a really whirlwind few years of growing as an accessibility advocate within the marketing space. Now, how did you dig into that self-education? How did you learn all that you learned once you decided that it was a topic of interest to you? I hopped around the internet quite a bit because most of the information that was out there was for web pages and websites and obviously physical facilities when it comes to accessibility. But obviously a lot of that also applies to the content that we publish on social media platforms. So I was finding different you know, blogs and articles and websites that would help me understand it from a broad standpoint and applying it specifically to social media where I could. And then obviously I'm not the only advocate out there. There were plenty of people sharing information or their experiences talking to people with disabilities has been a huge part of my education because I can't experience a lot of the stuff that I put into practice because I don't have a serious vision or hearing disability. So talking to individuals who do have those disabilities has been a huge part of my education. And I'm very grateful for the knowledge that they share. So I just did a lot of jumping around and I learn new stuff all the time. So it's, it's, never, it's never a completed journey. It's always something new every week that I learn. And as someone who, who follows you and who talks with you online a lot, I know that I, I would imagine a lot of people assume that maybe you have some sort of invisible disability or maybe you've got like a sibling or a parent or something. But but no, you just care. You just care about doing your job well and, and making it something everyone can consume. Right. <laughs> well, I, I do have invisible oh, disabilities. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I started learning about accessibility, I did not consider myself disabled, mm -hmm. which is a reality for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, we're very 
trained by stereotypes and the kind of stuff that we see in Hollywood media. Yeah. So everyone when they think means you're in a wheelchair, or you've exactly. got glasses and a cane or Exactly. Yeah. So disability is super broad and there are such things as invisible disabilities as you yeah. stated. So I have a chronic kidney condition. I have an articulation disorder which it's funny that I've gone into professional speaking because I have to think about it really hard. Um, I have almost no sense of smell or taste, and that was oh, wow. before COVID. So when COVID started, I'm like, I am in trouble. <laughs> Maybe you'll so, get yeah. a sense of smell and taste. Yeah, I know. That would be great if it just reversed it. Um, and then I also have some gnarly arthritis in my wrists, my knees, my hips. I have arthritis too. Nobody thinks young people have arthritis, but we do. Well, no, I've had arthritis too. since I was 18, I think, because I played uh, soccer and I was a goalkeeper. So lots of oh, throwing myself at the ground. So yeah, disability is super, super broad. And I think mm -hmm. the thing that a lot of people don't realize, disability is the only area of diversity, equity, inclusion that you can actually leave and enter because you might be injured and have a temporary disability and then heal from it. So it's super broad and it affects every single demographic out there, which is the only area of DEI that does that. So it doesn't matter if you're black, white, gay, straight, you are going to be impacted by disability at some point in your life, either through age, illness, or injury. And that's such a fascinating thing that people don't realize. I know that when I, I'll admit straight up that when I first started hearing, okay, add alt text on Instagram, which I'll admit I'm really bad with, but I'm trying, I'm trying. I've got you as a little angel on my shoulder, like <laughs> reminding me. But my first thought was, why is a blind person on Instagram? And, you know, there's a lot of answers to that. Um, I, I could answer it, but actually, could, could you answer kind of, because I think a lot of it is what you said about how people go in and out, right? People who are normally sighted. Mm -hmm aren't for a little while, things like that. Yeah, definitely. Also, it's important to know that, again, what we have been shown through Hollywood is not the reality for everyone. So just because someone says they're blind doesn't mean it's pitch black all the time. There are people who are legally blind, so they have extremely poor vision, but they can still see to a certain degree and just might not be as sharp as what you and I experience. But then of course there are people who become blinds later on in life. So, you know, a question I often get with alt text is do I need to include color in my alt text when I'm describing something? It's like, well, well, someone could become blind later in life. They still know what color is. So yes. And there are blind people that still see color. They just don't see fine details. So it's always important to remember that we don't want to turn the area of disability into this monolith. It is extremely, extremely diverse and we need to treat our content that way. We shouldn't be creating content for ourselves as a user. We should be creating content that reaches a broad audience from different backgrounds and lived experiences. Absolutely. Hey, Katie. <laughs> I say, sorry if you hear the cat. She wants input. So. <laughs> All good. She feels very strongly about digital accessibility. Um, mm -hmm. To that end, so you educate people and you have, you have become someone who people immediately think of when they think of digital accessibility. How did that build? And it seems like it was largely through, you know, content and conversations you were having, but, you know, specifically how, you know, what did people find that they found you? Uh, well, I did a lot of yelling on Twitter. I still do a lot of yelling on Twitter. Twitter is my favorite child when it comes to social media. I started blogging a lot, writing different articles about accessibility for social media. And I think the thing that really helped uplift my career, I guess, is that Sprout Social reached out and said, hey, can we publish you know, this, this piece that you wrote? Can we republish it? And I was like, yeah, please do. So that was super helpful. And then um, I remember tweeting that I was super bummed because the pandemic had started and I was supposed to speak at my very first conference that April about accessibility and hush up you, you got to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and I was bummed about it. So I tweeted, you know, how, you know, disappointed I was that I wouldn't be able to give this presentation and then suddenly I had uh, 
someone from the digital team for Harvard University reach out and say, hey, we'd love to hear your presentation. Do you want to come present to us? I was like, sure. Hello, Harvard. Yeah. So my <laughs> wow. first like big presentation on accessibility was to Harvard University. Nice. And then after that, I just kept presenting. Last year, I did 60 presentations um, virtually and in person. So it's been quite a journey. Yeah, you've even presented for the ADA, the Americans with mm -hmm. Disabilities Association. That's that's incredible credibility right there. Yeah, I got to speak at the ADA National Symposium. I've done a few presentations with the Great Lakes ADA Center in Chicago. So it's been super interesting to present to all these different organizations and help them understand the importance of accessibility for social media because it's so often overlooked. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because your presentations, your content, all of that, it's a combination of raising awareness, but also directly educating. So what kinds of content do you create and what, what do you put into your presentations that really gets through to people and helps educate them? It's definitely helpful when I share different examples that have been um, recorded through my phone with my text to speech program. So I'm a big fan of showing, you know, usable examples because that really drives home the point of when something isn't accessible for, let's say, a screen reader. People love those examples because it's it's so easy to understand why something works or doesn't work when you use those uh, demonstrations. So those are really helpful. When I give presentations in person, some of the bad examples, it's really funny to watch people's faces react to bad content when you can hear it aloud through a voice program. Absolutely. Especially like emojis, for example. Some of them, mm -hmm. it's just so interrupted, so, so interruptive, such gobbledygook. Um, that's one tip that I definitely got from you, which is to Put them towards the end if you use them but also mm -hmm. to be aware of what they sound like yes. on a screen reader so how can people find that out so my favorite website for emoji is emojipedia.org i love that website you get to see every single emoji along with their different uh appearances and descriptions across devices browsers and um, platforms so you know we have emoji that are very standard looking on an apple product but they might look different on a pc or on your phone on twitter there's so many different variations and i think a lot of people forget that so even like the pizza slice looks pretty standard when we see it sometimes it looks like it has pepperoni sometimes it doesn't depends on the platform that it's on so emojipedia.org is super useful and you get to see all of their different descriptions because most of them have more than one description i highly suggest going to check out what the eggplant description is because it has a couple of them <laughs> oh man yeah or or just leave that one out <laughs> to be on the safe side. yeah i highly suggest that you don't use mm. the eggplant although it's really fun to see it called aubergine oh, for yeah. anyone who's in europe and is you know classier than us in the yeah. states absolutely yeah my my favorite is pretty much always called red heart I, yeah I, I figure mine's pretty usable but pretty i pretty standard but one thing that you brought to my attention that i didn't even realize is that when you change the skin tone mm -hmm. of different emoji um, a lot of times it adds complication to the description as opposed to just leaving it to the default like Simpsons yellow. Yes. So because an emoji needs to be coded uniquely, mm -hmm. um, they get additional information added to their base description when you change their skin tone. So you could have raised hand, but then if you change it to the lightest skin tone, it's raised hand, light skin tone, raised hand, medium light skin tone, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so they all have to be unique. So when you change those skin tones, they get longer. And I get a lot of people with the debate of, should we change them? The yellow is seen as default and is seen as white. I said, then yeah. just don't use any of them. <laughs> I don't really <laughs> use any of the customizable emoji just because it's easier to uh, avoid that conversation then. Yeah. I just buy another emoji to use. So makes a lot of sense. Well, mm -hmm. um, when it comes when it comes to educating people on on these these issues, 
what other besides presenting and things like that what other educational uh undertakings have you done has anyone asked you to ask you to teach a course i know that you you have a book um what are some other ways that you're educating people besides going around and giving presentations and talking on twitter so one of the big things that i did earlier this year was launch the accessible social website which can be found at accessible-social.com um, this website actually came around because I was writing my guidebook and in my head, I knew that as soon as I published the guidebook, it would probably be out of date because of how frequently technology changes, how frequently the platforms update. So I wanted to create a more livable, uh, document where people could find information on accessibility. So I built the website to complement the book. So while the book can't really be updated all that frequently because it's a little hard to do that, I frequently update the accessible social website. So it has lots of demonstrations, examples, all the information that you would find in the guidebook or my presentations lives on the website and is constantly maintained and updated as needed. So that's been a huge part of educating other people. Plus, it also took a lot off my plate and I wasn't constantly having to repeat myself with some of the questions that I get. I just send people to the website. It's very nice to just have that spot. I would also just to put in a little plug for social media pulse here. Alexa also wrote us a fantastic guide on, on social media pulse dot community. Uh, it, I made sure it was one of the first pieces that was up on that site. Um, just some things, things to know, things to be aware of when it comes to digital accessibility. Um, all right, so in addition to the fact that digital accessibility is something that maybe social media managers aren't thinking of that they really should educate themselves on, um, you are a social media professional. I'm sure there's a ton of other things that you are educating yourself on. So I'd love to hear from you um, sort of how you go about doing that. How do you, as a social media manager, keep up on the latest in social media and educate yourself? I'm subscribed to a lot of newsletters, <laughs> a lot of different social media marketing newsletters out there that kind of go over new features, um, new trends is really helpful. Um, I really, really enjoy talking to my peers online and seeing what everyone else is up to. As a higher education social media manager, I'm part of the HESM Facebook group, which has like 10,000 of us in there from different universities and colleges, super helpful because we can bounce ideas off each other and kind of figure out what's working and what's not with students. So that's really helpful. Um, but yeah, just trying to keep up with everything as much as humanly possible and stay you know sharp with my skill set. So it's it's never that easy with how frequently the platforms update themselves and then retroactively fix themselves when we don't like something. <laughs> talking so, to you, Instagram. Yeah, I'm like, I'm talking to you, Instagram. What you doing over there? So yeah, it's, it's never a dull day when you work in social media because you're always learning something new and adjusting how you do things to be successful and engaging online. Absolutely. What are you personally geeking out on, on digging into right now in terms of upping your social game and how are you doing it? Uh, I, I'm <laughs> not really doing well, a lot. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to keep up with everything. I was experimenting with reels for a little bit on Instagram, but short form video is not yet my forte. Um, I'm, I know how to do video and edit video, but it's just mind boggling to me some of the creative things that some of these creators will come up with. And I'm just so envious of like how their brains come up with this content. So I'm really trying to get better at short form video and creative ideas and in a way that will engage our students because I really don't want to suddenly start our TikTok account or post a reel to Instagram and get students who are like, okay, what geriatric millennial came up with this? <laughs> you don't want to be chuggy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't want to be chuggy. I'm like, oh gosh, no more words to like insult me. So my cat's like agreeing with me down here. She's like, yeah, we don't need to be, you know, boring over here. Yeah. The cat's like, come on, mom or sis. I don't know. <laughs> 
but I, but uh, okay, yeah. So where are you going to learn about those things? Are you just kind of immersing yourself in it and watching a lot of it? Are you reading about it? How yeah. are you learning about short form? And I'm asking partially for myself. <laughs> the infinite scrolling to see like what's going on. Lots of scrolling, so much scrolling. Um, when I can, like finding those, you know, how to blog posts that people love to do, like what's working on TikTok and what's not. So it's just an endless lesson that usually stresses me out a little bit. (laughs) So, but it's really great to see what other universities um, and colleges do as well when it comes to TikTok, especially just because there's plenty that launched their TikTok like two years ago when the pandemic started. So, but yeah, it's, it's definitely like scary to me to think about launching a TikTok. And I know that I just need to rip the bandaid off and do it. Of course. If if your boss came to you and said, you know what, Alexa, we're an educational institution. We value education. Take like a semester sabbatical and just learn the heck out of something that'll make you better at your job. What would you do? I don't just mean what would you learn about it? What would you learn about? I mean, also like how would you learn about it if you just had like six months to just go off and learn stuff? How many marketing conferences can I pack into six months? (laughs) That would be my first kind of instinct is finding those marketing conferences that are talking about short form video because it's always really uh, useful to hear presenters on that and see, you know, successful examples of short form video or any kind of content. But also just experimenting on my own. I have a lot of video equipment that I have kind of adopted over the course of the pandemic. I bought a lot of new toys Mm -hmm. when the pandemic started to help me with different production of content. So just kind of experimenting on my own, using my personal accounts to see what works and what doesn't has been really fun, a little terrifying because it's the internet and it's not always the nicest place. But (laughs) I do pretty well when it comes to learning by doing so. um, Plus it's, it's always fun to like learn new things, especially when it comes to video learning how to use different programs and different tools is a lot of fun. So doing would be a big part of that. I'd probably come back from my sabbatical. Look at everything I made that can't be used for the college, but look how fun it is. I think learning by doing is one of the big hallmarks of our industry and social media mm-hmm. because it's always changing. So by the time you read something, it could be out of date. Yeah, um, definitely. Now, I assume that if you were to get the opportunity to teach a class, it would be on digital accessibility. But if you had to... Um, you know, dig into one particular element of it. What do you think, what do you think people are most lacking in terms of their education on that topic or even on any other topic? I don't want to box you in. If there's something else that you feel like social media professionals are lacking in their education, I mean, go for it. But what do you think people really need to learn? Alt text, definitely alt text. That is definitely the area that I get the most questions about. It's the area that scares people the most. Am I being descriptive enough? Am I not being um, concise? Is it too descriptive? What goes into alt text? What shouldn't go into alt text? There's so many questions around alt text and it really seems to stress people out when they first learn about it. And I've said before, I could easily do an entire presentation just on visuals for social media because visuals are such a huge part of social media content. When it comes to accessibility, on web pages, we have things called decorative images. So they're not really images that provide any context. They're like separators, dividers, headers that aren't that important. Um, with social media, if we choose an image, we chose it for a reason. There's no such thing as a decorative or unuse, not useful image for social media content. So I would definitely do a deep dive into alt text, how to write it effectively, different scenarios when it comes to sharing images with text on them, stuff like that, I think would definitely be the area I would dive into. Yeah, because alt text is really a unique art form in a way. And some people almost try too hard. I know someone who like 
described her her hairstyle and the pattern on her dress and and you know seeing things like that it can be a little bit daunting to try alt mm-hmm. text it's like how much do i have to put in so mm-hmm. so what would you tell people in terms of you know basic guidelines for alt text i think the most basic thing to remember about alt text is one it is subjective so you're going to be given an image and you're gonna write alt text for it a certain way and someone could have the same image and write it a completely different way. On the flip side, you could use an image for two different posts about two different things, but that image works for both. And the alt text you write might be different because of the context of the written part of your post. So it's completely subjective. And I always try to encourage people to think about when they're trying to describe their image, what does someone desperately need to know about this image what's important about it you have the power as the content author to decide that so you know does someone need the physical description of a person or do they just need to know that it's a headshot of christine gritman do you need to describe her in detail so it's it's really about what is important for a viewer to know that will also make that that image accessible what are you trying to achieve with that image and gifts too. That's another thing. A lot of a lot of people don't realize uh, with gifts. I know that I personally, I'm trying to get much better with putting alt text on my gifts, partially because I know you'll see them, but also because for mine it's really easy. Mine it's Christine on a red background, and I describe what you know my body mm-hmm. looks like doing, and I put in the the caption that I put yeah. on the gift. And it takes seriously five to ten seconds at this. Yep. Point. Um, and that's, that's the thing. You don't have to say everything. It's what do they need to know in order to get it? Yes, exactly. Why the heck you're using it. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So, so again, to go back to the self-education element, because we all have to do that as, as social media folks, what are some of your, so you love learning by doing that is huge. Mm -hmm. Immersing yourself in the platform, seeing people who are doing it, trying it yourself. What are, what are some other good sources? that you like, and you don't have to say Agora Pulse or social media pulse, like, <laughs> you know, but what, what are some sources that you go to for trusted information, even if they're just, you know, people you follow on Twitter? Um, well, I really like <clears throat> all of the blogs for the different management tools. So I think Agora Pulse and all of your competitors honestly have really good blogs that they either have their employees write or they bring in contributors. Always excellent to read those. Um, I follow a lot of wonderful people on Twitter, such as yourself, for learning about social media marketing and digital marketing. Um, Brianne Fleming, who we both love, is an excellent resource when it comes to learning about social media marketing, and her pop chat is wonderful. Um, A lot of my peers within the disabled community have been really great. The person that really comes to mind for me is Meryl Evans. So she's a digital marketer who is also deaf and the information she shares is just so good. And she's really helped me fine tune the knowledge that I have around captions and captioning etiquette. So she's just such a great source of information and just, just a really nice person. So those are some of my favorite people to follow and places to learn when it comes to expanding my own knowledge and experience. And now you also mentioned you subscribe to a lot of newsletters. I think a lot of us have a bunch of newsletters where we click subscribe, but we kind of, you know, they pile up a little bit, even if we did subscribe to them very deliberately. What are the ones that always get an open from you? Uh, my friend Nicole Tabak has a lovely newsletter that is Social Media Detox. So it does talk about social media, but she kind of gives you a little bit of a breather from you know, the hustle and bustle of working in social media. So I always really appreciate her newsletter. Um, Matt Navarra has a extensive newsletter to the point where I will open his newsletter and I have keywords that I scan for with his newsletter to make sure that I'm not missing any accessibility updates because his newsletter is so packed with Matt updates. Navarra's got everything. I think yeah. all of us consider Matt Navarra, even though he's, he's technically a secondary source, He's mm-hmm. the one who leads us to the primary source for so yes. many of us. Yeah. And then um, Leah Haberman also has a great newsletter that I really like. So she's like a more condensed version of Matt's <laughs> newsletter, but she really picks some really good topics to talk about every week. So I really like her newsletter as well. 
Nice. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us today, Alexa. Um, you know, what? I actually do have one more question regarding <laughs> education, which is, are there any particular um, trends you see um, moving forward in higher education social media? I think we're going to see probably more casual content. Mm -hmm. So less of the button up where this prestigious university, this prestigious college, here's the information and more of the fun stuff, which we've started seeing over the last few years. Yeah. So just a little more laid back, easier to talk to, less like you're talking to a robot and more like you're talking to an actual human being. So that's what I would love to see. And I think what we've started seeing and it's just, it's so nice. And it's just easier content for us to produce actually than the really buttoned up stuff. So that's my hope for education. Being human on social media spans all industries as it yeah. ought. All right, so Alexa, tell the good folks at home where they can find you in all of your various things. Sure. So you can find me on Twitter, which is, again, my favorite platform at uh, hashtag Hey Alexa. You actually have to write out hashtag. And you can also find me on my personal website, therealalexa.com, or the accessible social website, accessible-social.com. So I also run the accounts for social media tea, which you can always find at Sippin Social Tea. So hopefully it'll give you a laugh and a little bit of break from the stress of working in social media. Absolutely. And you've appeared on um, one of our, our sister pieces of media, uh, Aaron from Agora Pulse has mm -hmm. a podcast, Confessions of a Social Media Manager. And I was so excited that she had an episode with you just because you don't only have your own experiences, you mm -hmm. share other people's experiences. And I love the way you do it too. You do it in a very accessible way where it's, just the text folks and, yeah. and you know, the image is of text but then you have the alt text that is the text that's on the image and then your caption is just the text presented without commentary which yeah really need to be heard <laughs> yeah it was it was great to talk with aaron me and my partner uh austin really love talking to her and we always love talking about social media tea so Got to sip that social media tea. I understand completely. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Alexa. I, I already follow you everywhere, but I will continue to happily do so. And uh, to the point of what newsletters always get an open, your newsletter always gets an open from me. Thank so, you. So thank you for, for educating us all in a way that's so appealing and is so important for us to learn. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. And thank you for being here and watching our very first episode of How I Do My Job. We're going to be coming at you the first week of every single month with that, with, some, with an expert on that month's topic who is actually working in the trenches of social media. So next month in September, our theme for the month is going to be influencer marketing. So we're going to be uh, talking to a special guest who is av actively involved in, in creating that and doing that on social media. So you can hear it right from the people in the trenches. Please do let us know anything else that you would like to hear from the show. Let us know where you're watching, if you're live or on the replay, and anything else you'd like to see in the future. Thanks so much. <laughs>